Hi everyone, welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. My name is Jane Applegath, a former award-winning stockbroker, television producer, serial entrepreneur, yoga instructor, and now founder of the Epic Vision Zone. I'm here to help you fulfill your big dream by showing you how to create a powerful vision that is the portal to messaging, money, and meaning because what you say and why you say it is the key to achieving epic success on your own terms. That's why here at the Epic Vision Zone, we bring you some of the world's most influential people to inspire you to hit the go button on your epic life. A big thank you to everyone for joining us here today. W.E.B. Dubois wrote, there is no force equal to a woman determined to rise. Simon T. Bailey is the author of Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, A Guide for Men, the book destined to spark worldwide movement. In fact, Simon has committed to a life of purpose that sparks individuals and organizations to lead countries, companies, and communities differently. This current mission caps an illustrious career as a Hall of Fame keynote speaker and renowned advisor to companies in diverse industries. His framework is based on 30 years experience in the hospitality industry, including serving as sales director for Disney Institute in Orlando, Florida. As a prolific author and speaker, Simon has worked with Signet Jewelers, Salesforce, T-Mobile, General Mills, and Hilton Hotels, just to name a few. He has three online courses featured on LinkedIn Learning that reach professionals in over 100 countries. Recently, Simon became a certified Caritas coach leading with heart-centered intelligence. I can't wait to dive into that. His approach is grounded in caring science which focuses on preserving human dignity and wholeness. It is Simon's gold cast video about a conversation with his daughter that inspired this book and the movement and post that has spurred 90 million views on Facebook. Imagine that. Welcome, Simon. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, thank you so much. So good to be with you. Well, I am so excited to dive into this topic and I can imagine that it sparked a movement because coming from a man and writing a book that we have to listen to the women, uh, Simon and I had a little discussion ahead of time. It is just hysterical, I have to say. So not hysterical, <laughs> but very important too. So sure. give us give us some idea of what inspired you. I know your conversation with your daughter, but what inspired you to write Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, A Guide for Men? So you heard about the conversation with my daughter and I went to a therapist at the request of my divorce attorney. And the therapist, Anita, said to me, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. And when she said it, it was just like somebody uh, hitting me right between the eyeballs because she said, you have a lot of potential to be better, but until you address your mother issues, until you address the issue with your daughter and your soon to be ex-wife, you will carry that behavior into the next relationship. So it was a huge wake up call for me. And I said, wait a minute, hold on, what are you talking about? And so after going to therapy once or twice a month, one to two hours a month doing the work, I recognize that when I get right with all of the women in my life, that me fulfilling my potential is, is unlimited. Wow, that is so powerful. Hallelujah. <laughs> What can I tell you? Now, was your therapist uh, a woman? Yes, her name was Anita. Anita, she's oh, been yes. practicing for, for 40 years, has more degrees than a thermostat, and uh, she's the real deal. <laughs> wow, I have to say, it's, it's, a, it's amazing, isn't it, Simon, how one sentence can yes. turn the light bulb on, and it's that yeah. perspective, right? Like, that just hit you. I, I love that. What was she? What did she say? Can you just repeat that once more so our audience can solidify that in their minds? 
Yeah, she had did the research on me prior to coming into the therapy appointment. And she said, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. And so she was inviting me to look in the mirror and do the work. Yes, that we that that we all have to put that sentence up on our mirrors. That's so it's so powerful. Absolutely. Why is now you write in your book now the age for women and should more men recognize this? Here's why this is the age of women. And let me give you the research. Um, according to McKinsey Consulting, when women are leading um, from a senior executive level, the business is 25 percent more profitable. Uh, as you know, right now, there are more women in college than men. So what that means in the years ahead, women will be elbowing men out of white collar positions in companies and organizations. And here's the other interesting thing. 85% of consumer decisions and spending is made by women. 92% of the healthcare decisions and vacation plans made by women. 65% uh, of the automobile purchases made by women. And in fact, the NHL National Hockey League has just identified their, gra their fastest growing population of fans are women. Wow, yes. So businesses have got to be thinking if they are going to move into the future how do they ensure that women are leading or co-leading the discussion of where the organization can go and how do organizations begin to look at how they how do they attract women into the organization how do they activate their genius and their brilliance and how do they intentionally advance women to help move the business forward and this is not just big corporations this could be small all, mom and pop, how are you ensuring if you have a daughter or a cousin or a female colleague that's working in there, how do you invite her to think and use her brilliance to move the business and organization forward? Yes, I could see how incredibly important that is. And I love that you, you broke down all those statistics so that, you know, people can get an idea of branding and marketing and speaking in a woman's way because like mm -hmm. you said they are the decision makers in so many aspects of not only life but in business as well uh so yes. and and i believe if i'm not incorrect that that number is growing and in, in other yeah. words the the number of women getting involved um making decisions owning the finances of the household is growing Yes, it is. It really is. And businesses and organizations or even communities that want to thrive must welcome now more than ever before the female energy, the yin and the yang, that different perspective that creates better outcomes for everyone. Absolutely. I, I love that you said that the yin and the yang, the energy, because I, I've, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So emotional honesty, and thank you for that, that answer, by the way, you in your book, you have written emotional honesty is the combination that opens the vault of a woman's soul. Oh, I love that, by the way. So so it just touches me. Tell us what you mean by that. And what does authentic emotional honesty look like in a man? Emotional honesty is just simply saying, I don't know what I don't know. Sometimes mm -hmm. men tend to pretend that they know and they make it up as they go along. So I'll give you a quick example. I was talking with a gentleman not too long ago, and he said they had posted a position uh, for in their company and they wanted men and women to apply and there were probably be about uh, seven to eight traits that they had identified well women were not applying and the reason they were not applying is because they didn't feel that they had all of the traits 
Whereas men were applying, and let's say they only had three of the seven or eight traits that were needed, they figure out that they could bluff their way through it and, and figure out the West, the, the rest. So the difference between men and women, right? And when they went and did the deeper dive and began to talk to women, they said, yes, you do have the ability, go ahead and apply. So emotional honesty is really coming to the place to say, I don't know what I don't know. And guess what? women know that sometimes men don't know and they make it up, <laughs> but they're just waiting for us to show up and to be truthful to say, well, I guess I don't know. <laughs> right, right. I could see that um, being difficult in a professional environment uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you want, you don't want to admit that you don't know. Is there another way that a man could Approach that question without seeming like he's he's you know not doing himself a favor I was I'm just curious yes so one of the examples is in my own journey and this is personally and professionally uh, what I realized there were some instances where I was in over my head and if I went to my then spouse and said to her you know what I really don't know the answer to this, and I'm not going to even pretend like I know. Will you help me? She would mm -hmm. step up and say yes. Mm -hmm. But what I recognize is I didn't have to have all the answers, and I didn't need to be right all the time. She was just waiting for me to acknowledge that she was brilliant and that she could take the lead and find the solution. But sometimes what prevented emotional honesty was for uh, coming forth was ego. Ego is mm -hmm. edging goodness out. And when you move the ego aside to say, can, can you help me? That's where you really discover how to partner. Uh, in professional circles, if you say to a colleague, you know what, I may say something that it might not come out right. Will you extend me grace to help me understand why what I just said totally nosedive? How can I say it better? That's emotional honesty. That's releasing the need to be right and to pretend and to truly become open to say, how do I grow through this moment? Wow. We need to get you going around the world, Simon. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a whole new language for men to to approach it, can you extend me grace? See, a woman would resonate with that so much that she would be, yes, whatever you need, you know, tell me how can, because that that's kind of our language, uh, but that it, it's powerful, it really is. I mean, it, uh, words are so important, but thank you for giving us that example because like I, I know and you know, and most men, it's often very difficult for them to say, I don't know what I don't know. You know, so that, that's those were great examples. So you being an advocate for women, what should men do right now to be advocates for women professionally and personally? Number one, champion their ideas. If you're mm -hmm. sitting in a meeting and a woman has just shared an idea and there's crickets, no one is endorsing it, supporting it or giving feedback. But then a few minutes later, another guy will say, hey, I had this idea and it's a take off from her idea. It's your responsibility as an ally to say, time out. You just poached her idea. We need to give her credit and let her share why this idea is important. So number one, be a champion for women. Number two, understand how do you give women a hand up, not a hand out. What do I mean? Mm. If there are projects or opportunities to help uh, innovation happen, how are you ensuring that you're making uh, a female a part of that team, if not leading the discussion? Why? Men sometimes have a linear view of how to see things. Women have a 360 degree view of how to solve something. So if you give a woman a problem, she will give you a dissertation because of how she's wired. So it's important to ensure that you were helping her move forward in, in contributing to the organization. And if there's a third one that I would ask is really understand the difference between selective hearing and authentic listening. 
When I talk about selective hearing, sometimes you hear what you want to hear because you don't see a woman as, as she is, you see her as you are. So you see her and talk to her through your lens. But when you shift to authentic listening, you understand the same letters that spell the word listen, spell the word silent. So you'll say, mm. here's what I heard you say. Uh, is this what you meant? Can you unpack that for me? Can we drop a pin and can you tell me more? And it's in the tell me more that she knows that you've moved from communication to connecting to what's most important in that moment. Mm. I love this is a, that is so I love that that you said moving from communication to connection. And also connection. yeah, connection is so important especially for women. I mean it really yeah. is. Uh, and that's that is and and I love that you said that some men are linear I could tell you, Simon, 99.9% .9 of men are linear. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Coming from a woman, I'm telling you, it's not some. It's like you're lucky because it's so, I read that in your book and you said, ask a woman a question and she'll give you a dissertation because I do it with my husband all the time. He's like, oh my, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a part of your genius that that's a part of who you are because you don't need us as men to fix anything we just need to listen and you will find the solution as you talk it out because women emote emotion you are emoting as you're talking and so yeah <laughs> yeah well you got you have most men to agree with you there we really emote <laughs> they're like oh no here she goes but but I love your point of view. It's the point of view. It's the perspective. You see that you you're, you're changing that 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 habitual listening and like oh no here she goes again. But maybe it's like maybe I should tune in and hear what she's really saying. I know you get a lot of pushback from some men on that one, but but beautiful. I, I love it. So why are men intimidated by women in the workplace and what can be done to bridge the gap of the inequities? So the first thing I hear from men in a world of me too, right? Am I going to say something that's going to be taken out of context? And so in other words, instead of engaging in dialogue, it's better to just shut down and not say anything, right? The second thing is, um, how am I perceived uh, by this woman? And sometimes even men will make up a story in our head that's not necessarily true. And it prevents us from really engaging to ask for feedback, ask for input, ask for what do you think we should do? And then I think the third thing that I am observing uh, in some organizations is men flat out are concerned that they have been left out of the conversation of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and they're wondering, are they still relevant? And so how do we, to borrow a line from Sheryl Sandberg, um, how do you begin to lean in, lean into that? And I think there are a few ways to lean into it. Uh, number one, find a female colleague that you work with and say, hey, I am struggling with X. I trust you enough to come to you to say, can you help me think about what just went down in this meeting or this particular assignment? How should I approach it? And, and I, I don't want to walk on eggshells, but I want to make sure that I'm appropriate and that I'm being a good team player. Next, have you taken a specific class to understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like, especially as it relates to engaging females? And, and specifically, are you doing the work that whenever you hear men marginalizing or telling off-color jokes about women or making comments that are inappropriate, do you shut it down? Do you speak up and say, guess what? That's not cool. That, that's not tolerated. That's not who we are. And I think when men are very intentional about standing up when no one is looking around to say, hey, why are you saying this, buddy? You know, hey, it's a good old boys club. No, you be the one that's different and say, we're not going to do that. That's not smart. Yes, absolutely. That that would definitely um, 
make a difference, a huge difference. But like you said, it's moving out of that, what you're used to. It's moving out of a comfort zone for men, a lot of men. Uh, but it's that it's through that movement that we grow, right? And that, that becomes the collaborative sort of example of how to collaborate and how we can best work together. So that was absolutely very insightful and, and something we could all practice. Cause I think it goes both ways. It's not just the men, it's some women as well, you know, cause they're, yeah. they're really not, they're not accustomed to that. So they're like, they might be a little like, what's going on here? <laughs> Why are you being so helpful? But still, yes, absolutely. I can see why you're, you're doing, you know, we'll get into that later about presentations, but yes, this is a topic that really is, I could see it just catching on like wildfire. Why are men afraid to be open? So honest and vulnerable with women, even when the, even with the women that they love. From the time men are raised, we are taught never to cry. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't be emotional because you will be perceived as a wuss. You don't have a backbone. And if you feel a tear coming on, suck it up because men don't cry, right? And if you are vulnerable, it might be a sign of weakness, which then impacts your masculinity, right? But what we have come to realize that in vulnerability is strength because in vulnerability is your power, it is your power to come from a place of emotional congruence. Emotional congruence as defined by Rabbi Harold Kushner is you have the alignment of your head, your heart and your hands. So when men are taught that vulnerability is not uh, making you less masculine, but it's making you more uh, in tune <clears throat> with everyone around you, then you show up differently because, so, so I'll give you an example. So I'm, I'm in therapy and all of a sudden I'm just like, oh my goodness, I gotta spill my guts, right? And then I'm encouraged to write a letter to my ex, really just expressing, hey, you know what? I knew our marriage was over, but I wanted to pretend like everything was okay. And I said, wait a minute, that's the problem. I've been pretending because I didn't want to open up and I wanted to keep the mask on to impress people who didn't give a rip about us because we had to project something to society. And we were already uh, experiencing death by a thousand cuts in our marriage. And vulnerability was to show up and say, let's take the mask off and let's just talk about what's really going on. And when I reach that place in my own journey and I start having conversations with men, well, here's what I began to discover. People started to have empathy towards me with accountability. So they were empathetic, but they were also saying, okay, now that you've reached this place of vulnerability, cry me a river, don't cry for me, Argentina, you know, like all of these things. So what are you going to do? right? Because there's vulnerability with accountability to say, I'm going to get better. I'm not going to project onto her what was my unfinished business. I'm going to take ownership of what I need to do. And we are going to build a bridge from where we are to where we can go together. Mm, yes. Because lots of times people speak about vulnerability, but they don't add the accountability. So you're right, because if if we hear that men or women, they think, well, OK, I'm being I'm spilling my guts, as you said it. You know, I'm here. I'm wide open. But now what? You know, am I just right. going to be a sobbing mess <laughs> because I'm being vulnerable? Right. But the accountability is the key. And I love that you said it. It, it puts you. It was it a congruent or did you say alignment? Yeah emotional congruence you know emotional. so i'm not spamming you you know with cry me a river but i'm saying okay right. here's where i'm at here's what i am willing to do will you help yes that is so important that yeah absolutely so here thank you for that simon i i this is uh so much food for thought um, here is something that women have been practicing for a long time, which is well-being and mental health. Tell us what men can do to focus on well-being and mental health and why it matters. 
So the first thing I would encourage men to think about is to get centered. Uh, I just recently uh, took a Caritas coaching class with Dr. Jean Watson, who's a scholar in this space. And one of the things she helped us do is just to get centered and it's just taking a deep breath. Uh, and so it's inhaling, exhale uh, two or three times and just being, being in that moment. That's the first thing. The second thing that men can think about is taking their meds and meds is an acronym that stands for meditate, exercise, diet, and sleep. Make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Uh, if we were to double click on sleep, research says that when you have proper sleep, it's like emotional first aid for the brain. It helps you reset. So as you start the next day, because of proper sleep, you can show up. And then obviously we know all the research around exercise and dieting. But let me just talk about meditation just for a moment. We are in a world where we are overwhelmed by a terabyte of information. And we are bombarded with thousands upon thousands of messages every day. Taking mom, uh, moments at the very beginning of the day to just meditate and get quiet. Because men, how you start the day, and women, how you start the day determines the day. So meditation could be 15 minutes where you take the first five minutes, you just get quiet. The second five minutes, you read or listen to something that inspires you. The third five minutes, you stretch and get aligned with the day. Those are just some ideas as we think about mental health and well-being. Yes, and so simple. You know, uh, mm -hmm. many times we see this and they think, oh, no, now I've got to go and get this or I have to do that and I don't have time. That's always the biggest excuse is that I don't have time. But the nice thing is that this doesn't require that much time. It's really, it's time that's important for yourself. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely. The I agree with all of that. And I love the acronym that you've provided there so that it's so easy to remember. And giving your permission, giving yourself permission to do it. I mean, that's yes. the big thing, right? I mean, because we often feel, well, I've got to tough it out or I don't have time for that. I've got more important things. Well, no, you need permission for self-care because if you're not there, then no one's going to be there with you either. You know, like you said, we're not congruent. We're out of alignment. So mm -hmm. absolutely, I all men need to take that as a practice. And I think that would not only start their day off, but what would really make their year <laughs> you know, to get into yes. that practice. Yes, absolutely. Well, in your life, Simon, how did you apply some of these principles to bounce back from divorce debt and self-doubt? Yeah, I think the first thing I had to come to a place of implementing the four practices that I talk about in the book, forgiveness, surrender, gratitude, and practicing human compassionate care. So when I talk about forgiveness, uh, my mom and I had went through a really tough time and I realized I needed to come to a place where I forgave my mom. I called her and she said she had been waiting for 30, almost 35 years to have this conversation. We had the conversation, the healing began. And so we came to a place of, of forgiveness. Uh, surrender is, I s sometimes can be a control freak and always want to control all the details. And when you surrender, you release the need to be attached to the outcome because you're letting it go so that you can let come what wants to emerge. And gratitude is all about waking up every single day to be grateful. So every day I am grateful for just life. Recently, I went to a funeral for a colleague of mine that I work with at Disney, 56 years of age, died of pancreatic cancer, left this earth too soon, but it was a wake up call for me to be grateful that, hey, I'm here, and what am I going to do to live my life as if it was the last day? Uh, and then when I talk about practicing human compassionate care, it's about understanding that the, the best of us must help the rest of us. And so if I'm walking into a grocery store, how do I hold the door uh, 
for the person that's come in behind me, or at least extend myself, give them a card, a smile, a hello. It's not that difficult. So those are some of the things that we've been working on every day. It's hard, but we try to do our best every day. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's it's wonderful because it's it's the awareness of those first and foremost, yeah. because we often go through, well, not often, we mostly go through life kind of in a haze, you know, or, or we're unconscious. I mean, we just, you know, we don't think about the door. We don't, we like, you, you know, you, you said about helping individuals or addressing things. We just put it off to the side and we're just like, well, you know, th that'll come or this will come or won't or whatever. But yes, absolutely. I was really, really taken. And thank you for, for giving us an insight into those four practices, because I wanted to ask you, caring science, I had never heard of that before. And I'm interested in the how this came about about because you mentioned uh, the woman's name who is can you give us a little bit more insight into what caring science is yes so caring science has been in the healthcare field for decades and mm. i truly stumbled upon it i was uh, doing a session for stanford healthcare 1500 of their leaders and one of their executives reached out to me and said a lot of the languaging that you shared is a part of caring science and i was like what's caring science and they're like you got to go and look up dr jane watson who's a scholar at the university of colorado at boulder 40 years of her research, and she's uh, she's known as the Lady Gaga of nursing, 40 years of her research is to look at the bedside experience that happens when nurses are working with patients and how you can bring caring science, caring about the human being, not just the symptom or the issue, but really seeing them as a whole person and languaging things in such a way where you come alongside as a guide and a, as a help, not just how quickly can we turn this room? How quickly can we get, get you in and get you out? So caring science is really practicing heart-centered intelligence instead of coming from a very intellectual academic way of here's how we lead here's how we should do things it's slowing down to the speed of life to understand that number one in a human being that's in front of me do they feel valued do they feel seen do they feel appreciated and how do I show up as a human being in that moment to care about their humanity not for what you can get from them, but how you can serve them without looking for anything in return. So caring science is slowing down to the speed of humanity to say, in this moment, how, how do I come alongside you and honor you for whatever is going on and let you know that you matter and you belong and I am here in this moment with you. That's caring science. Mm. That is incredible. I'm definitely going to have to look that up. And I can see how that evolved from being at the bedside of patients and the nurses that deal with them in, in that way, hopefully, you know, um, but basically, yeah, I love that slowing down to the speed of life. Yes. Wow. Yes. There's a sentence that Go ahead. Go ahead. I've never said that before, but that that just came out of me. That's how I think about it. I love that, Simon. You that we, you need to post that because it'll make people think. First of all, they go, "Well, did he make a mistake?" But then when you un unwrap the caring science with it, it is that's one of those sentences that, like I say, that sticks with you. I mean. I'm, I love words and, and I know how powerful uh, statements can be. And that is so, it, it really makes you stop and think. Absolutely. Because this is the sort of environment that we are creating for ourselves. And we're not slowing down to the speed of life. We are speeding up to the speed of nothing. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're forgetting our humanness. And actually, that's interesting because that was one of the things that Eckhart Tolle mentioned where technology might become an issue, not because it provides us with so much connection and, 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 and knowledge, which is really a, an asset. But the downside is that if we do 
forget how to connect as a human because it takes away our humanness, you know? So that, oh boy, this is, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for unpacking that. And I'm so glad I asked because it, it really, I was curious, curiosity. So a man's core philosophy, what are some of the dangers of men not paying attention to their own core philosophy? They will follow men who have a need to push women down as they prop themselves up. When men do not have a core philosophy, they will follow whoever has the loudest megaphone. And whoever has the loudest megaphone might not be the person that has the best character because uh, whoever has your ear has your life. A man can never take you to a place that he has not been himself. So when a man really has a core philosophy, he is always mindful of his character because character happens when no one is looking. So a core philosophy helps you, number one, understand your vision. Number two, live your purpose. And number three, always be in a mode of self, uh, selfless service instead of selfish service. Mm. There's another one, selfless service instead of selfish service. Mm -hmm. Yes, because when we give, we receive. And it's so powerful. Um, you know, I know you've been in sales, I've been in sales, and it's so interesting. The, you know, I, I was taught way back in the day, you know, the hardcore sales, especially being in the brokerage business, it's like, you know, I want, I need, give me, you know, what, what it is. And, uh, and now things have changed and we have so much more information and philosophy on how we as humans work, our minds, our brains, our hearts, everything and the energy and so on and so forth. So yes, core philosophy is so important. Just tell me a little bit about how a, a man would, would, unpack his core philosophy? Like what would be some of the questions he could ask himself? First of all, who are the most influential people in your life? Because mm -hmm. I can tell you where you'll be five years from now by those who you associate with. And sometimes, and this, this happened in my own life, sometimes you're married, but you're not associating with men who are marriage minded. So who's in your sphere of influence? That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, Eric Hoffer, a noted philosopher, says in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the unlearned will find themselves beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. So who is challenging you to learn, unlearn and relearn? What books are you reading? What conferences are you going to? Are you continuing to grow? Because when you stop growing, you stop living. And when you stop living, you stop adding value to your relationship, to your business, to your life. So number one, relationships, who's in my life? Number two, how am I learning? And then the third thing, how do I begin to look at my dream of where I want to go? And how do you look through the windshield of what's possible instead of the rear view mirror of where you have been? Because the moment you begin to focus on that dream, that dream literally pulls you into the future through the power of imagination. You begin to daydream in the imagination, which is image a nation. So the images show up in the dream to pull you forward instead of backward. And all of a sudden, what you continue to focus on shows up because there's only two things you have in life. You have energy and time. How do I put my energy and time to the image, the dream that is moving me forward instead of backward? Beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. I so believe in what you said. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, you 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 can't change the past, but we can create the future. And absolutely, learning and all of that was um, perfectly said and so so powerful. So yes, and that applies to everyone. 
you know, men, women, um, and, and the young people as well. Imagination is so important because what you focus on, that where, where your focus goes, your energy flows. Yes. So yeah. in simple yeah. terms, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. So taking action, what's the first action a man should take once he's read your book? Oh my goodness. So the first thing I would encourage him to think about is who is the woman in your life that needs to be celebrated right now? What would it be like to write her a letter? And I know this is a page out of the notebook, the movie, but number one, write her a letter. Number two, instead of just saying to her, you love her, tell her why you cherish her. And then number three, think about the other women in your life. It might be your daughter, it might be your sister, it might be a niece, it might be a cousin, your mother, your mother-in-law. Find one thing to appreciate and value about them and tell them and make it a point to do this early and often. That's how you can take action right now. And also really decide that when you do this, why you're doing it. I believe the outcome for you is that you will be celebrated. Number two, you will be seen as an ally and an advocate. And number three, you'll be seen as a person that is willing to come alongside women to share with them what makes them awesome. Great, I love it. Taking action, yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that we can't just plan, we have to take the action. So those are perfect, absolutely. Women and your book, is this just for men and what should a woman know about it? It's for women as well. In fact, we've heard from women all over the world who have gotten more out of it. They said, I've got more out of it than, than my husband or spouse or friend. We just got a call the other day from the folks at Meta or Facebook. They are looking at the book and perhaps bringing it into their organization uh, for their women's uh, resource group. So it's definitely for women. And some of the key takeaways is I invite women to think about how are you doing right by other sisters that you work with, other women? Mm -hmm. How are you ensuring that you're being an advocate and an ally uh, as well? Yes, absolutely. I could see that. I mean, this book is applicable. It's like I said, I have read the book and I have to say, I, I want to share this with the audience. It is engaging. It is fun. It's one of those books that you can just open and flip and find something profound, something uh, to spark your energy, something to learn. And I love that you know, um, and, and it's, it's got some great visuals in it. So, and, and, and just some great tips. So yes, as a woman, I've really enjoyed the book. Uh, my husband hasn't read it yet, but I'm going to give it to him to read. <laughs> but absolutely, I, I can see where Meta would reach out to you or any other female organization because it, it, it actually helps us understand men more as well and then where we can help. But see, that's a woman that we're always looking to nurture and, and learn and grow. And it was interesting. I just wanted to go back a little bit. You said that when things are changing, you want to learn what's changing or you get left behind. Well, just as a little insight, I do get on quite a few um, platforms with coaches, some of the large ones. And do you know, Simon, the majority of the people on those that are learning and growing and trying to work with this ever-changing world that we're in now that is just going to continue to change, they're mostly women that are on those platforms. There's just a handful of men. And I don't know, maybe it's because the, and it, it's not, they're all not all led by females. You know, a lot, I'm sure you've heard like yourself, top coaches. So you are in that realm and it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. So I, I, I feel what you're saying and I really, really, um, I do believe that we are on the cusp of things making it a, a changing and, and turning over. So a question for you, what's one life lesson your work has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? I think the life lesson is releasing the need to be right and being mm -hmm. open for what wants to emerge for who you become in the process. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent. So 
where can our listeners find you, Simon, and get a copy of Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life? Yeah, they can go to ignitethepowerofwomen.com. And when they go to the website, they'll see that we have a free one-year impact plan that they can create uh, and download. And also there's a six-week e-course uh, that we have created for individuals to go deeper. And we're gonna be releasing uh, Ignite the Power of Women in Business, uh, which will be a six week e-course all right there at ignitethepowerofwomen.com. Wonderful, is that e-course just for men or is it for women as well? It's for women as well. We've already had a corporation reach out to us and they're going to pilot uh, the six week course for men and women. Because uh, what I realize is that you need each other. You can't, yeah. you know, you can't have men working on something and women working on something. You need each other. So there's a 36 page workbook that goes with it. There's some videos of me teaching in just digital snackables and inviting people to really operationalize this mindset uh, into their organization, both men and women. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. I need to, I, I, I encourage everyone to check it because all of these things that you've been talking, I'm sure they're uh, talking about are all woven into the, these teachings and they're so valuable, not only professionally, yeah. but personally as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question on your, your LinkedIn um, classes. What, what were they centered on? Because that's a big platform so for professionals. Yeah, the first one is building business relationships. Everything that I've learned in 30 years comes down to business is done with relationships. The second course is leading through relationships. So a person has been working in an organization, they get promoted where you don't leave your friends, but how do you now lead them? And then the third course is called finding a sponsor. Uh, one of the things that I learned the hard way in corporate America is that we've been taught you need a mentor yes you do and you need a sponsor someone who sits in a room that you don't have access to that can use their brand uh, relevance and their brand credibility to help elevate your career so how do you find a sponsor those are the three courses mm. wonderful they sound so valuable thank you for sharing that presentations you are are you speaking to audience now about this topic Yes, I'm so excited. So yes, I'm speaking to organizations about this topic of Ignite the Power of Women uh, in Business, because I think it's so important right now, especially as companies are looking for innovative breakthroughs. And uh, I just believe you got to unlock the potential of women and do it uh, consistently and appropriately. Yes, I could see that. Um, now, for presentations, people can go to your, your website as well and find yeah. information how to book you, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, they can go to simontbailey.com. Okay, wonderful. And we'll have all that information as well. What are you most excited about now in your life? You know what? I'm so excited to hear from individuals who have read the book and are doing the work. A gentleman from South Carolina got on a plane, flew to Orlando where I live a few weeks ago, and he said, this book saved my marriage. I heard from another guy who said, I read this book, I'm blown away. I got an Instagram message from a woman at the beach said, I just read your book. I have sent out a message to everyone that follows me that said she got so much out of it. So I wrote the book from a very deep place. I, I literally get raw, real with everyone. It took me three years to write it, but to get the feedback that it's helping individuals, that means more to me than anything. And then here's the best part. We are giving proceeds, uh, a percentage of the proceeds from the book to Global Servants International, which mm. specifically work with young girls in Thailand and Africa to ensure that they do not experience human sex trafficking, but they uh, fulfill their education, they live in a decent home, that they're fed. And so we, I, I just said, we got to tie this all together. So the ability mm. to help girls uh, around the world, uh, from my wife and I, we think that's just so important. And that's what encourages us now more than ever before. Oh my gosh. And I could feel that your energy just went through the roof, um, which is so exciting because you're right. You're giving and in giving back, you receive. And that is so important. Uh, so vital. Yes. I, I definitely want to share that as well. 
So any last words that you would like to share with our audience before we go? I would just simply say to everyone listening to us, uh, when you ignite the power of women in your life, it's counterintuitive. You actually ignite the power within yourself and mm -hmm. women are the benefactor. So find a woman today that's near and dear or important to you in your life and just identify three things that you appreciate about them and tell them why you're sharing mm -hmm. it with them. And just don't do it once, do it early and often. You need to put that on social media as a challenge to men. Here's a challenge for I, you men. Oh my gosh. I mean, even if like a fraction of them did that, it would be fantastic. Can you imagine the ripple? It would it hopefully it would become a movement. <laughs> but, you know what's but that, interesting? I, I was recently speaking at an event and I challenged all the men to pick up their phones and order flowers and send them to their wives, not because they were in trouble, but to carry this message forward. I got an Instagram message for a guy that said his wife was bawling after oh. she got the flowers because it was a surprise. She wasn't expecting it. And I said, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, it's because you don't give them just on a special occasion. It's just because, you know, mm -hmm. because you're appreciated or you're recognized or the love, you know. Yes. Wow. That is fabulous, Simon. I I challenge you to do that at every presentation <laughs> to all the men in the audience. <laughs> it's true. I think it's great. That's fantastic. Put it on Meta when if when you get in there, because I'm not going to say if I'm going to say when, because I know you will get in there. So that would be ginormous. They could put a whole world challenge out there. All the men yes. send flowers to the one you love. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. I love it. Yes. Yeah, just because. Yeah, just because. And, and of course, some of them will think, okay, what has he done wrong now? <laughs> but we don't need to go there. Yeah. So because we're here on the Epic Vision Zone, Simon, I have one last question for you. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? Wow, the title would be Spark individuals to lead countries, companies, and communities differently. Mm. Yes. I love that. I could see that for sure. Well, thank you once again, Simon, for joining us here. I have learned so much and it has been a true pleasure. I encourage everyone to be sure to check out Simon's website at simontbailey.com and to be sure to get your copy of his fabulous book. I absolutely love it. It is just, like I said to Simon earlier, it is, it's fun, it's engaging, it's informative, and it's a must have for anywhere that you go. And it's easy and fast to read. And you can also find Simon's contact information and more on the Epic Vision Zone bio pages. So be sure to check that out. And follow me on Instagram at Jane Applegath. And don't forget that you can reach me at janeapplegath.com where you can grab your free download, The Keys to Your Dreams. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dream into epic success. <music>